Hi, everybody. There's a lot of people here. That's super intimidating. Um, let, let me start by thanking Fred uh, and Stefania um, for founding Inner City Filmmakers 25 years ago. Uh, 25 years is a long time, and as someone who's sort of run a company for only six years, uh, I can't fathom what 25 years looks like. So thank you for your labor and your blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, sort of on behalf of the entire industry, thank you for that. Um, it's really an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Um, and before I forget to do so, I also want to congratulate all of you graduates for finishing uh, this program, which, I, yeah. Come on. Um, I have no doubt that it was sort of at various times exhilarating, exhausting, uh, demoralizing, and inspiring. Um, you're making films, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, I, I regret to inform you that that won't change at any point. If anything, the highs will be higher and the lows will be lower. Um, but that is, that is the life you have begun to choose. Um, I also want to congratulate your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, your younger and older siblings who are here with you. Um, I have no doubt that at various times for them, it was also exhilarating and exhausting and uh, inspiring and frustrating. Um, you were sort of, they, they, they feel the same things that, that you do. And uh, for some of you, I'm sure it was more exhausting and frustrating than others and looking at the faces of some of the people that are here with you, that I appear to be right about that. Um, and if you're wondering, those 13 of you, if you were the ones who were more exhausting for your parents, you're, you're probably right. And their laughter confirms it. Um, look, this is, I, I know it's a very special day for you, but it's also a very special day for me. Um, I, I turn 40 in a couple of months, and this is actually the first uh, graduation speech that I have ever given. Um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, I give a lot of speeches these days. Just two weeks ago, I was in Locarno, Switzerland, giving a keynote at, a, uh, at an industry conference. Um, and uh, that was cool, uh, but this is my first graduation speech. It's actually a lot cooler. Um, and a graduation speech is a little bit of a different thing. It's different because when I talk at most conferences, uh, most speeches are exactly the same, and if you give people anything that's even a little bit different, they think it's the most amazing thing in the world. And looking at me, I'm sure you can imagine that I'm a little bit different than what they usually see. Um, and I suspect that y'all's definition of a little bit different is a little bit a higher standard, and uh, so I'm nervous, I'll be honest. Um, second, when I'm asked to talk to industry folks, my job is to give it to them straight. And giving, them the, giving it to the industry straight in 2018 uh, means being the bearer of a lot of bad news. Uh, box office in the US is pretty much flat. Internationally, it's growing, but there's a lot of competition for it. Uh, the post-theatrical uh, revenue stream has basically evaporated and costs continue to rise. Oh, and the business has always been terribly efficient and has historically prevented roughly 75% of the population from participating in it, uh, and it's costing them more money they, than they even realize. Uh, to put it shortly, uh, the folks running this town are shook, and it is my job to keep them shook. It is also your job to keep them shook, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, that's not really graduation speech stuff, though, is it? Um, in fact, I've been specifically asked to inspire and encourage, uh, which if you know me well or you follow me on social media, you know isn't exactly by vibe, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, and I'm gonna do that by telling you guys a story. As I mentioned, uh, I, I, I'm almost 40, which means that almost 40 years ago, I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, my parents were in the army, um, and we moved around a lot when I was a kid. And when I was eight years old, we moved to a town in West Central Georgia called Columbus. Uh, it is a small town, uh, best known for Fort Benning, which I think is still one of the largest army bases in the country. And uh, it's the kind of place with gun racks and Confederate flags on the cars. Um, that is where my father is from, uh, where his father is from, and where his father was born a slave. Uh, I was a black nerd in the Deep South while Steve Urkel was on television. I've often joked that uh, the only way my social life would have been worse in high school is if I had been gay and my best friend was, so it was effectively as though I was as well. Uh, the consequence of this was that I spent most of my Friday and Saturday nights not at parties with my friends because nobody was inviting me, 
Uh, and I was not on dates, because no one was checking for me. Uh, I was in movie theaters by myself. Um, I probably saw every major studio release between 1991, which is about when my mom first felt comfortable leaving me at a movie theater by myself, to 1996 when I left for college. Um, and when I got to college, uh, I already screwed up, 1996 when I went to college. Now, I wasn't watching movies because I wanted to work in movies. Uh, in fact, it never really occurred to me that I could. Um, I didn't know anybody who had. I didn't have access to a video camera, and even if I had, I don't think that it would have occurred to me that that was something that I could do. Making movies was something that those people out in LA who didn't look like me um, and didn't look like anybody I knew well did. It was honestly more realistic for me that I'd be an astronaut and go to the moon than that I would ever be involved in Hollywood. I was good at math and science. I was in decent shape. NASA had an application process. Hollywood didn't. I imagine some of you guys have felt similarly. Um, so I went to college. I majored in social and political theory. I graduated in the year 2000, which I'm realizing now was right after some of you were born, which is very upsetting. Um, <laughs> Very upsetting. Um, I worked in politics for a bit in Ohio, ran a congressional campaign, and we lost. I wrote for a newspaper in Trinidad, which is where my mom's dad is from, got bored. Uh, I worked for a management consulting company in New York, got laid off. Not a lot of success early on. Um, and as I was enjoying sort of the, the little bit of pay that I got after having been laid off, I realized that I was spending all of my time watching movies or reading about uh, the film industry. And late one night, it was March of 2003, there was a massive snowstorm uh, in New York, and I was watching movies, and I thought to myself, you know, Los Angeles does not have snow, and I've always loved movies, and so why not give that a shot? Because I really don't want to go to law school, which was apparently the other option, if my parents were to be believed. And I moved to LA with less than $1,000 in my bank account and got a job as an assistant at CAA where I made less than $20,000 that year. Um, to this day, I can kill a ramen noodle with not much effort. <laughs> and I remember driving to the office hoping that I had time during lunch to run by the bank to deposit my check so that I'd have enough money to put gas in my car so that I could actually drive home. It was not easy. But I kept my head down, I did the work, I watched movies and read screenplays incessantly. Then I got my first executive job, and my second, and then another, and then another. And none of these jobs really worked out for me. Um, I had one boss who bragged about making his previous employees cry. Um, in another, uh, I was fired so that my new boss could bring in her own team. In another, I had two bosses die in a span of three months, both of cancer. Um, and about six years ago, I sort of gave up and started my own company. Uh, and today, I, I stand before you, your esteemed commencement speaker, uh, the founder of a company that called The Blacklist, that arguably has changed the marketplace for screenplays in Hollywood. Uh, having coined an industry term, The Blacklist Script, which is a good thing, and as a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. But it's fundamentally still weird to me uh, that I can say all of those things and that I'm here as your speaker because when I look in the mirror, I don't see anything special. Because when I look in the mirror, there's nothing special there. Fundamentally, I'm just a nerdy black kid from the deep south who loves movies. That's it. Um, that's what I've always been and what I am now. And when I look around at my colleagues that are most successful in this business, that's pretty much what they are. Nerdy kids who love movies. Lena Waithe, nerdy black girl from Chicago who loves movies. Barry Jenkins, nerdy black kid from Miami who loves movies. Issa Rae and Ava DuVernay, nerdy black girls from Compton who love movies. Ryan Coogler, nerdy black guy from Oakland who loves movies. He's also, incidentally, apparently was a very good football player in college, but that doesn't make him not a nerd. <laughs> um, so how did I end up here? How did Barry end up with two Oscars? How did Lena end up with an Emmy? How did Ava and Issa end up being 
literally cover girls. I'm going to tell you, uh, they leaned into who they are, nerdy kids who loved movies. They stayed loving movies, they watched them, they learned from them, they put their head down, they did the work, they helped each other, and they didn't let anybody tell them that they couldn't be exactly who they are. And I know some of y'all are looking at me, because I can see you, and you're basically thinking, yo, it ain't that easy. And I'll keep it real, it's not. It's a large part of it, but it's not that easy. It is hard work, and it is long work, and it's the kind of work that doesn't give you much reward until all of a sudden one day it does, and you never know when that's going to be, and it's almost always a lot later than you think it will be or what, when you want it to be. But on the bright side, no matter what you look like, no matter who your parents are, no matter how much money you have or they have in the bank, there has never been a better time to want to do what you want to do. Now, you've heard all of this before, I know, because I've literally heard it 20 minutes ago from Stefania. Uh, but when I was your age, you needed tens of thousands of dollars to have access to the quality of camera that you have in your pockets right now. Ditto the editing and post-production software. If you wanted people to see the movie you made, you needed to make a print, uh, which costs money, and a theater, which costs more money, and good luck getting anybody who worked in the industry to pay attention to you. Those are not the problems that you will have. They're not. The world has changed, and for the better. As of right now, with an internet connection of a few dollars and a few dollars a month, you can watch the entire history of cinema in the comfort of your own home. You can learn how to improve your writing and directing via thousands of sites on the internet. You can connect with other filmmakers and other people who share your worldview and your passion there as well. And any of you, all of you, literally everyone in this room, can make a movie with an iPhone and make it available to tens of millions of people with the stroke of a key. So find a way to do that. The problem you have is doing it well enough that anyone will care. So here's my advice. First, figure out a way to keep food on the table, your lights and the internet on. You don't eat, you're not making movies. You don't have lights or internet, you're probably not making movies either. Second, figure out how to take care of the people who have taken care of you. No one does any of this alone. And you most certainly didn't get here or anywhere else by yourself. You owe it to yourself and to the people who have loved you to match their investment in you, at a minimum. Then find your tribe. You already started that process. There are 13 of you here. That is your, that is your tribe. And make movies as a director, as an actor, as a writer, as all three, as an editor, as a production designer. I think the kids say, get in where you fit in, I think is the expression. So make movies, make shorts, make commercials, make anything, and then seek feedback and learn from it. Then make more movies, more shorts, more commercials, more anything, and then seek more feedback and learn from it. And then make more movies and more shorts and more commercials, more anything, and repeat until Hollywood comes calling. And I promise you this. If you do it long enough and keep improving, emphasis on keep improving, they will call. And even if you don't, whether you realize it or not, you will already be a filmmaker, which ostensibly was the goal all along. And here's the thing. This weekend, millions of people around the world, here in Los Angeles, in Lagos, Nigeria, in London, Millions of people are going to leave their homes. They're going to hop in a car or on the subway, or they're going to carry themselves by foot, and they're going to walk into a room and sit next to somebody they know or maybe somebody they don't know. The lights are going to go down, and they'll watch a movie. They'll watch a movie about robots or aliens or robot aliens or this weekend, giant sharks, crazy rich Asians, or black Klansmen. I've seen two of the three, and those two were excellent. I'm not going to tell you which ones. Um, but look, it, all of these movies, fundamentally, they're about what it means to be human. And everyone in those theaters will laugh, and they will cry, and they will feel awe and fear, and the full range of human emotion. And the lights will come on, 
and they'll go back into the world seeing it a little bit differently or feeling a little bit lighter and more able to deal with the very, very weird world we find ourselves in right now. It is a religious ritual. Repeated weekend after weekend after weekend. It's just like going to your church or your mosque or your synagogue or your temple. Fundamentally, movies are sacred. And the way we experience movies is sacred. And making the movies that those millions of people see is a sacred responsibility. I'll close with this. Shortly before his murder, Tupac Shakur was interviewed by MTV, and the interviewer asked him, you know, Tupac, do you think your music's going to change the world? And Tupac was like, you yeah, know, that's a dumb question. But I'll tell you this. My music will change the minds that change the world. You know, if, if I keep telling people how dirty the world is, maybe someone will clean it up. And so, too, is your opportunity with film. As your elder, which is still super weird for me, um, please keep making movies. Keep making better movies. Show the world the, the, show the world the world as you know it. Do it in ways that make us cry and make us laugh and make us feel awe and make us feel fear and make us see the world that we live in differently than we did than we went in to, to watch what you made. We need it. And I cannot emphasize this enough, and if you remember nothing else that I say tonight, remember this. We need it most from y'all. So congratulations again. This is an ending, but it is also more accurately the first of many beginnings. I look forward to repeating this speech at another commencement at some day in the future if I'm ever invited to do another one and using your names instead of Lena and Barry and Ava and Issa. There is no reason why that can't be any of you. Not long ago, they were exactly where you are. And so was I. So congratulations, and I wish you the best. Thank you.